Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter number 2, Matthew chapter number 2, as you're turning there, just want to mention a couple things here briefly. I want to say thank you to the choir for that particular song they sang, which gives us a little bit of a a sample of what we're going to have, Lord willing, here next week at our Christmas concert, and uh, so much looking forward to that. And uh, please keep this in mind along those lines is no, uh, there will be no 945 service next week, just the main 1115 and then Saturday night, as you know. Now, if you normally come to the 11, no big deal, you're here now. But the 945 crowd inevitably will always have somebody show up uh, for that particular service. So again, don't say that we did not tell you. Uh, No Sunday night next week, um, just a reminder for that as well. There's uh, some Christmas cards on the back, just a little reminder for all of you just to uh, maybe take one with you and invite somebody to our Christmas concert as well. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I have a little note here, just a reminder for this evening that tonight uh, we'll be uh, going over some of the things uh, took place in Vietnam and in Thailand. I don't have time to do it this morning, kind of give you a little update of the blessings of the services uh, that we had over there and the time with a couple of the men from our church in Vietnam that first week or so. And uh, so we did have some folks saved, which is a real blessing. First time we've ever had anybody, that I've had, ever had anybody saved over there while I was preaching. Uh, they got saved, they got baptized. And uh, so just a blessing, great stories. Show a few pictures tonight. A couple of the men will be giving some testimonies as well uh, as myself, give you a little update on the what took place over there and appreciate Pastor Kennedy and all the staff kind of holding down the fort and those preachers that filled in while I was gone. All right, Matthew chapter number two, we're going to read a couple verses and uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, Just keep this in mind. I told this to the early service. Um, I've only been back for about 72 hours and and so uh, with the jet lag, I'm not accountable for anything I'm about to say. I mean, literally, if I woke up three this morning, you know, I'm already ready to go to bed. And uh, so just uh, this is kind of my, uh, that clause, if you will. All right, Matthew chapter two. Let's just read a couple verses here together. Then we'll have a word of prayer. Notice if you would, verse number one in Matthew chapter two. The Bible says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning to worship you and to sing praises to your name and uh, thank you for the word of God and thank you for what we just read and the significance of it. And I pray for the next few minutes that you will help all of us just to set everything aside that maybe is in our minds or what we've got going on later today or next week and focus on your word. And may we be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and May we learn some things about keeping Christ in Christmas. We thank you for your love for us and your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for the greatest gift ever given to mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your goodness. I pray if there's somebody here not saved today that they'll put their faith not in religion but in the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And amen. I, I love Christmas. I love this time of the year. I don't know about you, but I love everything associated with it. I love the Christmas songs. I love singing them. 
Uh, I like them so much that even sometimes in late August, uh, we have a particular staff member that for whatever reason, he doesn't like Christmas music. So we come back from a staff meeting, I will lock my doors and I'll turn the Christmas music on and make him listen to it. He needs to learn. I won't tell you who it is. Yes, we know. I do. I love Christmas music. I love Christmas movies. I love them. How many of you have a favorite Christmas movie? What is it? Jingle All the Way? Way? It's a Wonderful Life. I was waiting. It took the third person. I love that movie, don't you? The Scrooge. I love The Scrooge. The second one. The first one's good, but the second one. I know there's a whole bunch, but I love Christmas movies. I love eggnog. I love the snow. Some of you don't. I know I get on the roads. I understand accidents and things like that. That's real. But I just love it. There's something about walking out early morning when it snowed. Isn't it just quiet and beautiful? I mean, it, later in the day, it gets slushy and it gets ugly and what have you. But the first snow, there's something about it. I love the snow. I love Christmas lights. I don't necessarily like putting up Christmas lights, but I like Christmas lights. You know what's a problem when you get a phone call uh, from your kids and they say, Dad, is it okay if we get on the roof? You know, sometime after Thanksgiving, you know what they're attempting to do. And um, so, you know, honestly, I'm not real good at putting those up. And Pastor Kennedy yesterday said to me, he says, did you know there are people that pay to have Christmas lights put up? I said, that is ridiculous. I cannot even believe that. There's a, there's a service that does that. I, I said, can I get their number? I know a guy that really needs it. I said, I cannot believe that. But uh, anyway, uh, everybody has their weaknesses. My message today is keeping Christ in Christmas. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, this can be a challenge for all of us to keep Christ in Christmas. With all the ancillary things that surround Christmas, if you're not careful, you can get caught up in it as well and it can weigh you down. The shopping, the shopping. I hate shopping. I hate it. I like Amazon. Because you don't have to deal with the crowds. I mean, I'd pay extra just for that. But many people don't like Christmas. Matter of fact, listen, listen. It's troubling to them. Look at Matthew chapter 2, if you would. Matthew chapter 2. Notice this particular statement. Verse 3. When Herod, the king, had heard these things, notice what the Bible says. He was what? Troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I think that's interesting. That it says he was troubled. Herod felt this way about Christmas. Do you ever wonder why Christmas is troubling to certain people? Do you ever think about that? An atheist organization uh, recently took out, uh, uh, I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and put billboards up that say, uh, you know, celebrate Christmas, skip church. Now, think about this just for a minute. Pause and just ponder what would cause a person to be so troubled by Christmas that they're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to spread their hatred for Christmas. Think about that. They're troubled by it. Now, there's a reason why they're troubled by it. Many in the world are troubled by Christmas. They don't even want you to say Merry Christmas because it bothers them for some reason. And you ought to think about why that is. What is it that bothers them? Listen, I, I, I may not like Halloween. I may not like Halloween, but, but I'm not gonna go out and spend tens of thousands of dollars, put up billboards all over the place that say, uh, you know, um, celebrate Halloween, kill a witch, <laughs> or whatever. I'm not. It may not be my favorite holiday, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. So there's something that causes them to do that. I heard uh, recently a story about a public school teacher in Virginia. And he had in his first grade classroom, he taught for some 40 years, first grade, and he had in his classroom, it said, Merry Christmas on the billboard in his classroom. 
And so the principal had come in and he said, you know, you can't have that in the classroom. It's against the law. And he says, well, I mean, I don't see the big deal in it. He says, I've got the liberty to do this. I can put Merry Christmas. He goes, no, you can't do that. So sure enough, it went to the superintendent. The superintendent came into the, came into the classroom and he said, listen, you, you can't have this. You can't have Merry Christmas in a public classroom. And so he says, I don't really see what the big deal is about having Merry Christmas on my billboard. And sure enough, the superintendent said, you don't understand, you're going to get fired if you don't take that down. Again, he said, I don't see what the big deal is. He said, Christmas is Jesus Christ's birthday. The superintendent said, that is the problem with you Christians. He says, you want to put Christ in everything, and now you want to put him in Christmas. <laughs> May I say to you that Christ was in Christmas before Rudolph, yes. before Frosty the Snowman, before candy canes, and all of the things that we see associated with Christmas, Jesus Christ was there. So notice in your Bible, if you would, in Matthew 2, the question is, again, with all the ancillary things in, of Christmas pulling at you, how do you keep Christ in Christmas? Matthew 2 says that Herod was troubled. You don't need to be troubled by Christmas. You need to rejoice in the true meaning of Christmas. Let's take a few minutes and, and, and ponder some things that will help us meditate on them. Look at some Kodak moments, if you will, in the life of Christ and, and the true meaning of Christmas. And really, I said it earlier, and I'll say it again, the greatest gift ever given to mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in your notes, if you would, the gift of Christ, the child. You know, when you see a manger scene, many times you see a baby. You see a baby. But in reality, if you study your Bible, you will see that it wasn't, and again, I'm, I'm fine. I don't care if they have a little baby in a manger scene. Fine, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with lights. I don't have a problem with a Christmas tree. I understand uh, Ishtar and Easter and all of that stuff. I understand Jeremiah 10 and, and all of that stuff, the, uh, the pagan aspects of what some people uh, and the roots behind some of it and Christ's mass, and I get all of that. But listen, I don't celebrate that. And I'm not going to sit there and well, I don't celebrate Christmas because da 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 Hey, if, if, the, if we're going to have a holiday recognized about Jesus Christ, well, it wasn't his exact day, why don't you just say, okay, let's just tell people about Jesus Christ and use this time, amen? So I understand, you look at a manger scene, many times it's a baby depicted. But it really wasn't a baby if you study your Bible, you will find and you trace it out, Jesus Christ at that time would have been, well, I mean, in the, he was a baby, obviously, when he was born, but when the wise men you see in Matthew chapter 2 got there, he would have been some two years old. Notice in your Bible, if you would, in Matthew chapter 2, uh, it says, when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. The wise men were looking for a star because of Balaam's prophecy in Numbers chapter 24. Now from Daniel 9, they knew within at least two years when to look for the star. Now I want you to hold your place in Matthew. Go to Numbers 24. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now I want to just pause here and just a little parenthetical, if you will, and, and look at something. It, it's kind of a little bit more Bible study stuff, but I, I get a blessing out of it when I studied it out. And just to show you something as a side note, that helps you to understand the true picture of what took place and keep Christ in Christmas and the significance of what took place some 2,000 years ago. Numbers chapter 24, look if you would at verse number 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Now we know that Jacob was Israel. 
Keep reading. And notice it says, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Uh, look up here for just a minute. A scepter is associated with a what? With a king. So understand here in this particular problem, see a lot of people think, well, in numbers, I read numbers to go to sleep. Sometimes in some obscure passages or whatever, you're going to find a nugget like what you just found here. Here's a prophecy written some 2,000 years prior to Christ talking about the star and that the wise men would come and seek that star. Now you see it here in Numbers 24 and verse 17. If you look at the passage, the wise men come from the east to know uh, and, and, and they're looking for a star. Okay, and that star leads them to Bethlehem. They came seeking a king because the verse said, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. I want you to consider that the star that the wise men saw, now, now this is my opinion, I, I believe this, the star that the wise men saw was, was not a planet. This is my opinion, okay? Jet lag, uh, no, but I honestly believe this to be true, and I could be wrong. Could I be wrong? I could be wrong. I don't believe that it was a planet and a star that you would particular envision as a star. Look at the verse again. It says, a star shall come out of Jacob. Now, the, they, when they, it was not a planet. I don't believe that. The star in Matthew 2, I believe, was an angel. It was an angel. The angel that standeth for the children of thy people. Hold your place in numbers. Go to Daniel 12. Now, I'm, just, I'm going somewhere with this because I want you to see it. Look at Daniel chapter number 12. You want to keep Christ in Christmas, then you will look at and, and consider and ponder and meditate on the true biblical significance of the Lord Jesus Christ and the true record of him and what took place some 2,000 years ago. Look at Daniel 12. Look at verse 1. And at that time shall who? Michael stand up. The great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Michael will stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, which was never uh, since, it goes on to talk about, uh, never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and the time thy people shall be delivered, every one shall be found written in the book. Go back to uh, Numbers 24. The star, I believe in Matthew 2, was an angel. That angel, Daniel 12, says, standeth for the children of thy people, Michael. He is Israel's what? He's Israel's star. He's Israel's star. Israel was Jacob's other name. The angels are said to be stars. You say, where do you find that? Again, follow me. This is kind of what I believe to be true. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. I'll go back, just hold your place there, but look at Revelation 120 again so you can see uh, what we're referring to here. Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 20. You say, how can an angel be a star? Well, look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. These seven stars are the what? So again, back in, Ma in Numbers 24, you see clearly... Michael, he's Israel's star. Israel's was Jacob's other name. The angels are said to be stars. And that particular star landed, set over, if you will, a house. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. So again, go back to Matthew 2 and notice this. Matthew chapter 2. Now again, I told you that was a little parenthetical just to study the thing out and kind of see the biblical significance of Christ the child. Christ the child. 
how do you keep Christ in Christmas? You look at Matthew chapter two, it says that Herod was troubled. Herod was troubled for a particular reason. Can I encourage you today, just because of what the world has tried to do to Christmas and the things that infiltrate even the lives of good godly Christians, don't let that trouble you. Keep Christ in Christmas, and the way you do that is you meditate on the biblical significance of who he is and what he really did. And don't, ge- don't be pulled down or taken away from all those things. Remember what took place. Don't let the world's interpretation of the story take away the biblical significance of what really happened. His birth was like no other birth this world has ever seen. And it was a gift to us all. Let's face it, there are many gifts that we get that we do not need. How many many of you have ever received a gift that you didn't need or that you didn't want? Say amen. Okay, you ever get a gift like that? You didn't really need it, didn't really want it? Okay, listen, um, an American Express survey, this this is important. They surveyed kind of about Christmas gifts and they found that fruitcake, stay with me, it's just important, was chosen most often, 31%, from a list of worst holiday gifts. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It even finished ahead of no gift at all. There's just, I got to get it out. I don't know what it is about this time of the year. Uh, It's been said, 21% of the people that received it would return it and 19% would give it away. So if you get re-gifted, you know, it might have been from, I don't know when, how long ago that could have been. It doesn't look like it's been since 1910. It's like each one you get, it doesn't mean if it's new, it's like a brick. You know, when it snowed the other day, I thought, what can I do to weigh down my truck? I'll put some fruitcake back there because (laughs) it's like a brick. So that was all I'm going to say about that. I know that it just is, I almost feel like it's the gospel. Sometimes you got to get it out. But think about, the, think about honestly, in all sincerity, the, the gift that the Lord Jesus Christ that we're referring to, the gift that we're talking about today is one that you can't take or leave. The gift that we're talking about must be received. According to the Bible, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody's exempt. You don't want to pay for your sins yourself. God sent his son to be your payment That free gift is so you can be saved. Some gifts you can take or leave. This gift is essential. So you have Christ the child, but I want you to look at Luke chapter two and consider Christ the son. Christ the son. Look at Luke chapter number two, if you would. Luke chapter number two. And look at verse number 41. The Bible says here, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind Jerusalem and Joseph, his mother, uh, uh, Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not. But they supposing him to be in the company went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. So, so here they are, follow me just a minute, for lack of a better um, terms or whatever, uh, they're, they're going to church together, they're going to go worship, they're going to Passover, and they go and they leave and they realize Jesus isn't with them. He's not here. Oh, they figure, they go a day's journey, they figure that he was with a bunch of family. So they kept going without him. But look at verse 45, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold thy father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. Uh, Look up here for just a minute. Let me say this. She says, thy father, but she's not referring to Joseph as his father. She's insinuating to protect him and and the testimony and what have you. She said, and by the way, it wasn't the Lord that said that. It was her that made the statement. Because look at what Jesus says about his father in the next verse. 
verse 49. He said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Joseph was a carpenter. He wasn't referring to Joseph. He was referring to his heavenly father. I think that's important because liberals will take that and try to throw it down your throat and say, see, that was his father. That wasn't his father biologically because he was born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter number seven. So something interesting to note about that particular passage, two things. Number one, I can't read it without mentioning this. The picture of the family going to church and they leave without Jesus. Okay? And I can't read it without thinking, there are many people that go to church, you know what they do? They leave without Jesus. They leave without him. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that you won't leave without him. But notice also, if you would, verse 49. These are the first words ever recorded of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. These are the first words that he ever says. Look at what he says. Wist you not that I must be about my father's business. First words ever recorded. And you know what it had to do with this? It had to do with his father. It shows what he came to do. But here's what's interesting about it. The last words ever recorded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew, uh, excuse me, look at Luke 23. Just turn over to one passage, Luke 23, and notice this. First words Jesus ever mentioned. Notice the last words Jesus Christ ever said. Look at Luke 23. Notice what he says. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. First words Jesus ever said were about his father. The last words he ever said were about his father. And I think that's significant uh, for many reasons. Christ the Son is the greatest gift ever given to mankind. And if you remember that, that will help you to keep Christ in Christmas. Otherwise, you're going to be caught up in all the ancillary things and you're going to get weighed down and you're going to get frustrated and it's going to trouble you just like it did Herod. But it takes discipline. Notice thirdly, the next aspect of this gift we see is Christ the man. Christ the man. Some amazing men have lived and walked on this earth and have done a, amazing things and no doubt the world's a better place because of what some of the men have done. A good example, I think in modern history, President Reagan stood by, by that uh, Berlin Wall and that Berlin Wall separated families and friends from 1961 for a long period of time and the communists built that wall in the mid 20th century uh, and that was to keep people from East Germany fleeing to West Germany. And President Ronald Reagan stood by that wall and if you remember the famous statement, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the history books we read hold men like this in high esteem, and that's great. But if you take all the great men and all their accomplishments and you put them together, they don't even hold a candle to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Not even for one second. Think about it. Consider these accomplishments, and they'll show you. I think Chase will pull up a couple of these on this. Just, just follow along here some of the things that took place that the Lord Jesus Christ did for you and did for me. He descended that we might ascend. He became poor that you might become rich. Now think about that. He left the ivory palaces, the streets of gold, set aside his royal vesture, condescended down to the hilltops of Judea, was born of a virgin, was wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, and the word became flesh for you and me. Though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. That's what he did. Yes, men have done great things through the years, but nothing like what Jesus Christ has done for you and me. He was born that we might be born again. He became a servant that we might become sons. He had a, no home that we might have a home in heaven. You know, the Bible says, the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. He was hungry that we might be fed. He was thirsty that we might be satisfied. If you read your Bible and you'll find out uh, in Isaiah 53 and other parts of the New Testament that when he was on the cross, he thirsted. He did that so you could be satisfied. 
He was forsaken that we could not be forsaken. And he was sad that you can be glad and he was bound that you can go free. And he was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he died that we might live. And he came down that we could be caught up. Those are just, those are just touching the hem of the garment of what Christ the Son has done for you and me. You want to keep Christ in Christmas? Meditate on these things. Consider Christ the child and Christ the son and Christ the man, but notice, fourthly, Christ the lamb. And I won't spend too much time on this point, very simple, but according to the Bible, Jesus Christ was the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. This was part of God's plan to redeem mankind. He was slain. He was, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world, so think about this. John, in John chapter 1 and verse 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Listen, folks, this is what Christmas is about. Jesus Christ. The child, the son, the man, and the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He was slain. But he was silent, Isaiah 53. Not only that, it was, a, it was not only was, it a, 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 was he silent, but it was also a sacrificial gift. I don't have time to turn there, but Genesis 22 makes it crystal clear, Genesis 22, that it was a, a, it's a picture there of the sacrifice that took place on the cross of Calvary. May we never lose sight of what this gift entails. And I want you to notice lastly here, Christ the King. Christ the King. Someday soon, Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth and he's going to set up a kingdom. Now, we know first and foremost, he's going to come back and there's going to be a rapture that takes place. The Bible makes it crystal clear that, and I, and I really believe this, when you look at what's happened in Israel and you look at the uh, Matthew 24, which is a tribulation passage, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places, those are indicative of the second advent. But when you look at the last days of uh, Israel, you see that, but the last, day of the church, last days of the church, it's, it's the falling away of the church. It's the, the church going into apostasy. And you see that today, which means the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back soon. I believe that. And he's going to, uh, when that trump sound, the dead in Christ are gonna rise first. Now here's the irony of it. Someday Jesus Christ is gonna come back He's going to call the church out. But he's also going to come back and his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. Amen? He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to judge the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. He's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. And you know what? Everything about his birth, his childhood, his manhood, his death, his burial, his resurrection have occurred just the way that God said it would. Now, if you're going to bet that he won't come back, you've got a problem. Amen? He's a coming king. He's coming back. Listen, Christmas is the promise. Easter is the proof, amen? It's a blessing, and we get to have a part in it. Now, if you look at the prophecies of the Bible of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see that he was prophesied that he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7. And, and matter of fact, not only did it prophesy he's going to be born of a virgin, if you read Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the details of the prophecy say specifically the city that he was going to be born in. Read that, it says it's Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Clearly a prophecy. We have a hard time telling whether or not it's going to snow in the next day or so. But God nailed it to a T some thousand years prior. He's coming back. I, I saw uh, many years ago a, a little cartoon characterization, you know, the little comic strips, and it showed some guys looking through the Hubble telescope, and it showed Jesus Christ coming back on a white horse and with a little caption that said, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> he's a coming king. You know what? He's a coming king, but there's some people that he's coming, and they're troubled because they don't know him. They don't know him. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, the Bible says, and you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed 
from heaven with his mighty angels. And it says this, when he comes back, listen careful, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who shall be, uh, I think it's verse number seven says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're gonna be troubled at his coming. But if you know him, hey, what a blessed hope. What a, what a tremendous future. And I'll say this, it doesn't get any better than that. But yet like any human gift, the love of God needs to be received. Think about that just for a minute. Imagine the reaction of your loved ones if you spent all the time and energy and effort on the most perfect gift that money could possibly buy and it was given to you and you turned it down. Imagine the reaction of that. You say, oh, I would never do that. There are many people that turned down the greatest gift ever given to mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they turned their back on it. And God says in 2 Thessalonians chapter one, they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You don't wanna be in that situation. He's a coming king, but it's also, he's also somebody who came and, and offered you salvation. But just like any gift that you may open on Christmas Day, that gift has to be received. You have to receive it. You can take the gift and you can say, I don't want it. There are many that do that. And if you're here today and you've never received that gift, I pray that you should understand the significance of that decision. God gives us not only his son, but also the free choice of whether or not to accept him. We can enter into the most wonderful gift of all the, this Christmas with a real personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we conclude today, I want to say this. With all the distractions of gifts, parties, Santa Claus, certainly drawn away all the attention from Christ, we need to clear our lives of all these things and focus on the real meaning of Christmas. Let me ask you a question this morning as we close. Are you going to make a concerted effort this Christmas to keep Christ in Christmas? Or are you gonna allow all of the tapestry and all of the ancillary things of Christmas to pull you away and next thing you know, you're running to this and going to that and doing this and doing that. And next thing you know, you're caught up in the very thing that will pull you away from the true meaning of Christmas. Don't allow that to happen with you. Christmas Day, given the opportunity, sit down with your family before you open any gifts and open up to Luke chapter two and read the passage and enter in to the glory that is Jesus Christ and worship him for who he is and for what he's done. And don't lose sight of the true meaning of Christmas. And if you do, it'll just be another day. Matter of fact, if you do, I'll end today where I started. You'll be troubled by Christmas. Oh, no, no I won't be troubled. You'll find yourself, if it's kind of like the outside looking in and you look down at yourself and you're just all distraught because you're being pulled apart in every way by Christmas. You've allowed it to take away from you the true meaning of Christmas. And we ought to worship him during this time, not worship what the world has depicted during this time. Let's pray.